Stirring Times in Austria, an essay by Mark Twain, part one of two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. And now, Stirring Times in Austria, part one of two. The Government in the Frying Pan here in vienna in these closing days of eighteen ninety seven one's blood gets no chance to stagnate the atmosphere is brimful of political electricity all conversation is political every man is a battery with brushes overworn and gives out blue sparks when you set him going on the common topic everybody has an opinion and lets you have it frank and hot and out of this multitude of counsel you get merely confusion and despair, for no one really understands this political situation or can tell you what is going to be the outcome of it. Things have happened here recently which would set any country but Austria on fire from end to end and upset the government to a certainty. But no one feels confident that such results will follow here. Here, apparently, one must wait and see what will happen? Then he will know, and not before. Guessing is idle. Guessing cannot help the matter. This is what the wise tell you. They all say it. They say it every day, and it is the sole detail upon which they all agree. There is some approach to agreement on another point, that there will be no revolution. Men say, look at our history. Revolutions have not been in our line, and look at our political map. Its construction is unfavorable to an organized uprising, and without unity, what could a revolt accomplish? It is disunion which has held our empire together for centuries, and what it has done in the past it may continue to do now and in the future. The most intelligible sketch I have encountered of this unintelligible arrangement of things was contributed to the traveler's record by mr forrest morgan of hartford three years ago he says the austro-hungarian monarchy is the patchwork quilt the midway plaisance the national chain gang of europe a state that is not a nation but a collection of nations some with national memories and aspirations and others without some occupying distinct provinces almost purely as their own and others mixed with alien races but each with a different language and each mostly holding the others foreigners as much as if the link of a common government did not exist only one of its races even now comprises so much as one-fourth of the whole and not another so much as one-sixth and each has remained for ages as unchanged in isolation, however mingled together in locality, as globules of oil in water. There is nothing else in the modern world that is nearly like it, though there have been plenty in past ages. It seems unreal and impossible. Even though we know it is true, it violates all our feelings as to what a country should be in order to have a right to exist. And it seems as though it was too ramshackle to go on holding together any length of time yet it has survived much in its present shape two centuries of storms that have swept perfectly unified countries from existence and others that have brought it to the verge of ruin it has survived formidable european coalitions to dismember it and has steadily gained force after each forever changing in its exact makeup losing in the west but gaining in the east the changes leave the structure as firm as ever like the dropping off and adding on of logs in a raft its mechanical union of pieces showing all the vitality of genuine national life End quote. that seems to confirm and justify the prevalent austrian faith that in this confusion of unrelated and irreconcilable elements this condition of incurable disunion there is strength for the government. Nearly every day someone explains to me that a revolution would not succeed here. It couldn't, you know. Broadly speaking, all the nations in the empire hate the government, but they all hate each other too, 
and with devoted and enthusiastic bitterness no two of them can combine the nation that arises must rise alone and the others would joyfully join the government against her and she would have just a fly's chance against a combination of spiders this government is entirely independent it can go its own road and do as it pleases it has nothing to fear in countries like england and america where there is one tongue and the public interests are common the government must take account of public opinion but in austria-hungary there are nineteen public opinions one for each state no two or three for each state since there are two or three nationalities in each a government cannot satisfy all these public opinions it can only go through the motions of trying this government does that it goes through the motions and they do not succeed but that does not worry the government much the next man will give you some further information the government has a policy a wise one and sticks steadily to it this policy is tranquillity keep this hive of excitable nations as quiet as possible encourage them to amuse themselves with things less inflammatory than politics to this end it furnishes them an abundance of catholic priests to teach them to be docile and obedient and to be diligent in acquiring ignorance about things here below and knowledge about the kingdom of heaven to whose historic delights they are going to add to the charm of their society by and by and further to the same end it cools off the newspapers every morning at five o'clock whenever warm events are happening there is a censor of the press and apparently he is always on duty and hard at work a copy of each morning paper is brought to him at five o'clock his official wagons wait at the doors of the newspaper office and scud to him with the first copies that come off the press his company of assistants read every line in these newspapers and mark everything which seems to have a dangerous look then he passes final judgment on those markings two things conspire to give the results a capricious and unbalanced look his assistants have diversified notions as to what is dangerous and what isn't he can't get time to examine their criticisms in much detail and so sometimes the very same matter which is suppressed in one paper fails to be damned in another one and gets published in full feather and unmodified then the paper in which it was suppressed blandly copies the forbidden matter into its evening edition provokingly giving credit and detailing all the circumstances in courteous and inoffensive language and of course the censor cannot say a word sometimes the censor sucks all the blood out of a newspaper and leaves it colorless and inane sometimes he leaves it undisturbed and lets it talk out its opinions with a frankness and vigor hardly to be surpassed i think in the journals of any country apparently the censor sometimes revises his verdicts upon second thought for several times lately he has suppressed journals after the issue in partial distribution the distributed copies are then sent for by the censor and destroyed i have two of these but at the time they were sent for i could not remember what i had done with them if the censor did his work before the morning edition was printed he would be less of an inconvenience than he is but of course the papers cannot wait many minutes after five o'clock to get his verdict they might as well go out of business as do that so they print and take their chances then if they get caught by a suppression they must strike out the condemned matter and print the edition over again this delays the issue several hours and is expensive besides the government gets the suppressed edition for nothing if it bought it that would be joyful and would give great satisfaction also the edition would be larger some of the papers do not replace the condemned paragraphs with other matter they merely snatch them out and leave blanks behind mourning blanks marked confiscated the government discourages the dissemination of newspaper information in other ways 
For instance, it does not allow newspapers to be sold on the streets. Therefore, the newsboy is unknown in Vienna. And there is a stamp duty of nearly a cent upon each copy of a newspaper's issue. Every American paper that reaches me has a stamp on it, which has been pasted there in the post office or downstairs in the hotel office. But no matter who put it there, I have to pay for it. And that is the main thing. Sometimes friends send me so many papers that it takes all I can earn that week to keep this government going. I must take passing notice of another point in the government's measures for maintaining tranquility. Everybody says it does not like to see any individual attain to commanding influence in the country, since such a man could become a disturber and inconvenience. We have as much talent as the other nations, says the citizen, resignedly and without bitterness, but for the sake of the general good of the country we are discouraged from making it over-conspicuous, and not only discouraged, but tactfully and skillfully prevented from doing it, if we show too much persistence. Consequently, we have no renowned men. In centuries we have seldom produced one, that is, seldom allowed one to produce himself. We can say today what no other nation of first importance in the family of Christian civilizations can say, that there exists no Austrian who has made an enduring name for himself which is familiar all around the globe. Another helper toward tranquility is the army. It is as pervasive as the atmosphere. It is everywhere. All the mentioned creators, promoters, and preservers of the public tranquility do their several shares in the quieting work. They make a restful and comfortable serenity and reposefulness. This is disturbed sometimes for a little while. A mob assembles to protest against something. It gets noisy, noisier, still noisier, finally too noisy. Then the pervasive soldiery come charging down upon it, and in a few minutes all is quiet again. There is no mob. There is a constitution, and there is a parliament. The House draws its members of 425 deputies from the 19 or 20 states heretofore mentioned. These men represent peoples who speak 11 languages. That means 11 distinct varieties of jealousies, hostilities, and warring interests. This could be expected to furnish forth a parliament of a pretty unharmonious sort and make legislation difficult at times, and it does that. The parliament is split up into many parties, the clericals, the progressists, the German nationalists, the young Czechs, the social democrats, the Christian socialists, and some others, and it is difficult to keep up working combinations among them. They prefer to fight apart sometimes. The recent troubles have grown out of Count Vedini's necessities. He could not carry on his government without a majority vote in the House at his back. And in order to secure it, he has had to make a trade of some sort. He has made it with the Czechs, the Bohemians. The terms were not easy for him. He must pass a bill making the Czech tongue the official language in Bohemia in place of the German. This created a storm. All the Germans in Austria were incensed. In numbers, they formed but a fourth part of the empire's population. But they urged that the country's public business should be conducted in one common tongue, and that tongue a world language, which German is. However, Bedini secured his majority. The German element in Parliament was apparently become helpless. The Czech deputies were exalted. Then the music began. Bedini's voyage, instead of being smooth, was disappointingly rough from the start. The government must get the Ausgleich through. It must not fail. Bedini's majority was ready to carry it through, but the minority was determined to obstruct it and delay it until the obnoxious Czech language measure could be shelved. The Ausgleich is an adjustment, arrangement, or settlement, which holds Austria and Hungary together. It dates from 1867 and has to be renewed every ten years. It establishes the share 
which Hungary must pay toward the expenses of the imperial government. Hungary is a kingdom, the emperor of Austria is its king, and it has its own parliament and governmental machinery, but it has no foreign office, and it has no army. At least, its army is a part of the imperial army, is paid out of the imperial treasury, and is under the control of the imperial war office. The ten-year arrangement was due a year ago, but failed to connect, at least completely. A year's compromise was arranged. A new arrangement must be effected before the last day of this year. Otherwise, the two countries become separate entities. The emperor would still be king of Hungary, that is, king of an independent foreign country. There would be Hungarian custom houses on the Austrian frontier, and there would be a Hungarian army and a Hungarian foreign office. Both countries would be weakened by this. Both would suffer damage. The opposition in the House, although in the minority, had a good weapon to fight with in the pending Ausgleich. If it could delay the Ausgleich a few weeks, the government would doubtless have to withdraw the hated language bill or lose Hungary. The opposition began its fight. Its arms were the rules of the house. It was soon manifest that by applying these rules ingeniously, it could make the majority helpless and keep it so as long as it pleased. It could shut off business every now and then with a motion to adjourn. It could require the A's and no's on the motion and use up thirty minutes on that detail. It could call for the reading and verification of the minutes of the preceding meeting and use up half a day in that way. It could require that several of its members be entered upon the list of permitted speakers previously to the opening of a sitting, and as there is no time limit, further delays could thus be accomplished. These were all lawful weapons, and the men of the opposition, technically called the left, were within their rights in using them. They used them to such dire purpose that all parliamentary business was paralyzed. The right, the government side, could accomplish nothing. Then it had a saving idea. The idea was a curious one. It was to have the president and the vice presidents of the parliament trample the rules underfoot upon occasion. This, for a profoundly embittered minority, constructed out of fire and gun cotton. It was time for idle strangers to go and ask leave to look down out of a gallery and see what would be the result of it. Part 2. A Memorable Sitting And now it took place that memorable sitting of the house, which broke two records. It lasted the best part of two days and a night, surpassing by half an hour the longest sitting known to the world's previous parliamentary history, and breaking the long speech record with Dr. Lecher's twelve-hour effort, the longest flow of unbroken talk that ever came out of one mouth since the world began. At 8.45 on the evening of the 28th of October, when the House had been sitting for a few minutes short of ten hours, Dr. Lecher was granted the floor. It was a good place for theatrical effects. I think that no other Senate house is so shapely as this one, or so richly and showily decorated. Its plan is that of an opera house. Up toward the straight side of it, the stage side, rise a couple of terraces of desks for the ministry and the official clerks or secretaries, terraces thirty feet long and each supporting about half a dozen desks with spaces between them. Above these is the President's Terrace, against the wall. Along it are distributed the proper accommodations for the presiding officer and his assistants. The wall is of richly colored marble, highly polished. Its paneled sweep relieved by fluted columns and pilasters of distinguished grace and dignity, which glow softly and frostily in the electric light. Around the spacious half-circle of the floor bends the great two-storied curve of the boxes, its frontage elaborately ornamented and sumptuously gilded. On the floor of the house, the 425 desks 
radiate fanwise from the president's tribune. The galleries are crowded on this particular evening, for word has gone about that the Ausgleich is before the house, that the president, Ritter von Abrahamowitz, has been throttling the rules, the opposition are in an inflammable state in consequence, and that the night session is likely to be of an exciting sort. The gallery guests are fashionably dressed, and the finery of the women makes a bright and pretty show under the strong electric light. But down on the floor there is no costumery. The deputies are dressed in day clothes. Some of the clothes need and trim, others not. There may be three members in evening dress, but not more. There are several Catholic priests in their long black gowns and with crucifixes hanging from their necks. No member wears his hat. One may see by these details that the aspects are not those of an evening sitting of an English House of Commons, but rather those of a sitting of our House of Representatives. In his high place sits the President Abrahamowitz, object of the opposition's limitless hatred. He is sunk back into the depths of his armchair and has his chin down. He brings the ends of his spread fingers together in front of his breast and reflectively taps them together with the air of one who would like to begin business but must wait and be as patient as he can. It makes you think of Richelieu. Now and then he swings his head up to the left or to the right and answers something which someone has bent down to say to him. Then he taps his fingers again. He looks tired and maybe a trifle harassed. He is a gray-haired, long, slender man with colorless, long face, which in repose suggests a death mask, but when not in repose is tossed and rippled by a turbulent smile which washes this way and that and is not easy to keep up with. A pious smile, a holy smile, a saintly smile, a deprecating smile, a beseeching and supplicating smile, and when it is at work the large mouth opens and the flexible lips crumble and unfold and crumple again and move around in a genial, persuasive, and angelic way and expose large glimpses of the teeth, and that interrupts the sacredness of the smile and gives it momentarily a mixed worldly and political and satanic cast. It is a most interesting face to watch. And then the long hands and the body, they furnish great and frequent help to the face in the business of adding to the force of the statesman's words. To change the tense, at the time of which I have just been speaking, the crowd in the galleries were gazing at the stage and the pit with rapt interest and expectancy. One half of the great fan of desks was in effect empty vacant, and the other half several hundred members were bunched and jammed together as solidly as the bristles in a brush, and they also were waiting and expecting. Presently the chair delivered this utterance. Dr. Lecker has the floor. Then burst out such another wild and frantic and deafening clamor as has not been heard on this planet since the last time the Comanches surprised a white settlement at midnight yells from the left, counter yells from the right, explosions of yells from all sides at once, and all the air sawed and pawed and clawed and cloven by a writhing confusion of gesturing arms and hands. Out of the midst of this thunder and turmoil and tempest rose Dr. Lecker, serene and collected, and the providential length of him enabled his head to show out above it. He began his twelve-hour speech. At any rate, his lips could be seen to move, and that was evidence. On high sat the president imploring order, with his long hands put together as in prayer, and his lips visibly, but not hearably speaking. At intervals he grasped his bell and swung it up and down with vigor, adding its keen clamor to the storm weltering there below. Dr. Lecher went on with his pantomime speech, contented, untroubled. Here and there, and now and then, powerful voices burst out above the din and delivered an ejaculation that was heard. Then the din ceased for a moment or two and gave opportunity to hear what the chair might answer. Then the noise broke out again. 
apparently the president was being charged with all sorts of illegal exercises of power in the interests of the right the government side among these with arbitrarily closing an order of business before it was finished with an unfair distribution of the right to the floor with refusal of the floor upon quibble and protest to members entitled to it with stopping a speaker's speech upon quibble and protest and with other transgressions of the rules of the house one of the interrupters who made himself heard was a young fellow of slight build and neat dress who stood a little apart from the solid crowd and leaned negligently with folded arms and feet crossed against a desk trim and handsome strong face and thin features black hair roughed up parsimonious moustache resonant great voice of good tone and pitch it is wolf capable and hospitable with sword and pistol fighter of the recent duel with count baldini the head of the government he shot badini through the arm and then walked over in the politest way and inspected his game shook hands expressed regret and all that out of him came early this thundering peal audible above the storm i demand the floor i wish to offer a motion in the sudden lull which followed the president answered dr lecher has the floor wolf i move the close of the sitting the president representative lecher has the floor a stormy outburst from the left that is the opposition wolf i demand the floor for the introduction of a formal motion mr president are you going to grant it or not there was a crash of approval on the left i will keep on demanding the floor till i get it the president i call representative wolf to order dr lecher has the floor wolf mr president are you going to observe the rules of this house tempest of applause and confused ejaculations from the left a boom and roar which long endured and stopped all business for the time being dr von pessler by the rules motions are in order and the chair must put them to the vote for answer the president who is a pole i make this remark in passing began to jangle his bell with energy at the moment that wild pandemonium of voices burst out again wolf hearable above the storm mr president i demand the floor we intend to find out here and now which is the hardest a pole skull or a german's this brought out a perfect cyclone of satisfaction from the left in the midst of it someone again moved an adjournment the president blandly answered that dr lecher had the floor which was true and he was speaking too calmly earnestly and argumentatively and the official stenographers had left their places and were at his elbows taking down his words he leaning and orating into their ears a most curious and interesting scene dr von pressler to the chair do not drive us to extremities the tempest burst out again yells of approval from the left cat calls and ironical laughter from the right at this point a new and most effective noisemaker was pressed into service each desk has an extension consisting of a removable board eighteen inches long six wide and a half inch thick a member pulled one of these out and began to belabor the top of his desk with it instantly the other members followed suit and perhaps you can imagine the result of all conceivable rackets it is the most ear-splitting intolerable and altogether fiendish the persecuted president leaned back in his chair closed his eyes clasped his hands in his lap and a look of pathetic resignation crept over his long face it is the way a country schoolmaster used to look in days long past when he had refused his school a holiday and it had risen against him in ill-mannered riot and violence and insurrection twice a motion to adjourn had been offered a motion always in order in other houses and doubtless so in this one also the president had refused to put these motions 
by consequence he was not in a pleasant place now and was having a right hard time votes upon motions whether carried or defeated could make endless delay and postpone the ausgleich to the next century in the midst of these sorrowful circumstances in this hurricane of yells and screams and satanic clatter of desk boards representative dr kronewetter unfeelingly reminds the chair that a motion has been offered and adds say yes or no what do you sit there for and give no answer the president after i have given a speaker the floor i cannot give it to another after dr lecher is through i will put your motion storm of indignation from the left wolf to the chair thunder and lightning look at the rule governing the case kronewetter i move the close of the sitting and i demand the a's and no's dr lecher mr president have i the floor the president you have the floor wolf to the chair in a stentorian voice which cleaves its way through the storm it is by such brutalities as these that you drive us to extremities are you waiting till some one shall throw into your face the word that shall describe what you are bringing about a tempest of insulted fury from the right is that what you are waiting for old greyhead long continued clatter of desk boards from the left with shouts of the vote the vote an ironical shout from the right wolf is boss wolf keeps demanding the floor for his motion at length the president i call representative wolf to order your conduct is unheard of sir you forget that you are in parliament you must remember where you are sir applause from the right dr lecker is still peacefully speaking the stenographers listening at his lips wolf banging on his chair with his desk board i demand the floor for my motion i won't stand this trampling of the rules underfoot no not if i die for it i will never yield you have got to stop me by force have i the floor the president representative wolf what kind of behavior is this i call you to order again you should have some regard for your dignity dr lecker speaks on wolf turns upon him with an offensive innuendo dr lecker mr wolf i beg you to refrain from that sort of suggestions a storm of hand clapping comes from the right this was applause from the enemy for lecker himself like wolf was an obstructionist wolf growls to lecker you can scribble that applause in your album the president once more i call representative wolf to order do not forget that you are a representative sir wolf slam banging with his desk board i will force this matter are you going to grant me the floor or not and still the sergeant of arms did not appear it was because there wasn't any it is a curious thing but the chair has no effectual means of compelling order after some more interruptions wolf banging with his board i demand the floor i will not yield the president i have no recourse against representative wolf in the presence of behavior like this it is to be regretted that such is the case a shout from the right throw him out it is true he had no effective recourse he had an official called an ordiner whose help he could invoke in desperate cases but apparently the ordiner is only a persuader not a compeller apparently he is a sergeant-at-arms who is not loaded a good enough gun to look at but not valuable for business for another twenty or thirty minutes wolf ran on banging with his board and demanding his rights then at last the weary president threatened to summon the dread order-maker but both his manner and words were reluctant evidently it grieved him to have to resort to this dire extremity he said to wolf if this goes on i shall feel obliged to summon the ordiner and beg him to restore order in the house wolf i'd like to see you do it suppose you fetch a few policemen too there's a great tumult are you going to put my motion to adjourn or not dr lecker continues his speech 
Wolf accompanies him with his board clatter. The president dispatches the ordiner, Dr. Lang, himself a deputy, on his order restoring mission. Wolf, with his board uplifted for defense, confronts the ordiner with a remark which Boss Tweed might have translated into, Now let's see what you're going to do about it. Noise and tumult all over the house. Wolf stands upon his rights and says he will maintain them till he is killed in his tracks. He then resumes his banging. The president jangles his bell, begs for order, and the rest of the house augments the racket as best it can. Wolf, I require an adjournment because I find myself personally threatened. Laughter comes from the right. Not that I fear for myself, I am only anxious about what will happen to the man who touches me. The ordiner, I am not going to fight with you. Nothing came of the efforts of the angel of peace, and he presently melted out of the scene and disappeared. Wolf went on with his noise and with his demands, that he be granted the floor, resting his board at intervals to discharge criticism and epithets at the chair. Once he reminded the chairman of his violated promise to grant him, Wolf, the floor, and said, Whence I came, we call promise breakers rascals and he advised the chairman to take his conscience to bed with him and use it as a pillow. Another time he said that the chair was making itself ridiculous before all Europe. In fact, some of Wolf's language was almost unparliamentary. By and by he struck the idea of beating out a tune with his board. Later he decided to stop asking for the floor and to confer it upon himself, and so he and Dr. Lecker now spoke at the same time, and mingling their speeches with the other noises, and nobody heard either of them. Wolf rested himself now and then from speech-making by reading, in his clarion voice, from a pamphlet. I will explain that Dr. Lecker was not making a twelve-hour speech for pastime, but for an important purpose. It was the government's intention to push the Ausgleich through its parliamentary stages in one sitting, for which it was the order of the day, and then by vote refer it to a select committee. It was the majority's scheme, as charged by the opposition, to drown debate upon the bill by pure noise, and drown it out and stop it. The debate being thus ended, the vote upon the reference would follow with a victory for the government, but in the government's calculations had not entered the possibility of a single barreled speech which could occupy the entire time limit of the setting, and also get itself delivered in spite of all the noise. Goliath was not expecting David, but David was there, and during twelve hours he tranquilly pulled statistical, historical, and argumentative pebbles out of his script and slung them at the giant, and when he was done he was victor and the day was saved. In the English house, an obstructionist has held the floor with Bible readings and other outside matters, but Dr. Lecker could not have that restful and recuperative privilege. He must confine himself strictly to the subject before the house. More than once, when the president could not hear him because of the general tumult, he sent persons to listen and report as to whether the orator was speaking to the subject or not. The subject was a peculiarly difficult one, and it would have troubled any other deputy to stick to it three hours without exhausting his ammunition, because it required a vast and intimate knowledge, detailed and particularized knowledge, of the commercial, railroading, financial, and international banking relations existing between two great sovereignties, Hungary and the Empire. But Dr. Lecker is president of the Board of Trade of his city of Brunn, and was master of the situation. His speech was not formally prepared. He had a few notes jotted down for his guidance. He had his facts in his head. His heart was in his work, and for twelve hours he stood there, undisturbed by the clamor around him, and with grace and ease and confidence poured out the riches of his mind in closely reasoned arguments, clothed in eloquent and faultless phrasing. He is a young man of thirty-seven. He is tall and well-proportioned, and has cultivated and fortified his muscle by mountain-climbing. If he were a little handsomer, he would sufficiently 
reproduce for me the Chauncey Depew of the great New England dinner nights of some years ago. He has Depew's charm of manner and graces of language and delivery. There was but one way for Dr. Lecher to hold the floor. He must stay on his legs. If he should sit down to rest for a minute, the floor would be taken from him by the enemy in the chair. When he had been talking three or four hours, he himself proposed an adjournment in order that he might get some rest from his wearing labors. But he limited his motion with the condition that if it was lost, he should be allowed to continue his speech, and if it carried, he should have the floor at the next sitting. Wolf was now appeased, and withdrew his thousand times offered motion, and Dr. Lecker's was voted upon and lost. So he went on speaking. By one o'clock in the morning, excitement and noise-making had tired out nearly everybody but the orator. Gradually the seats on the right underwent depopulation. The occupants had slipped out to the refreshment rooms to eat and drink, or to the corridors to chat. Someone remarked that there was no longer a quorum present, and moved a call of the house. The chair, Vice President Dr. Kremartz, refused to put it to a vote. There was a small dispute over the legality of this ruling, but the chair held its ground. The left remained on the battlefield to support their champion. He went steadily on with his speech, and always it was strong, virile, felicitous, and to the point. He was earning applause, and this enabled his party to turn that fact to account. Now and then they applauded him a couple of minutes on a stretch, and during that time he could stop speaking and rest his voice without having the floor taken from him. At quarter to two, a member of the left demanded that Dr. Lecher be allowed recess for rest, and said that the chairman was heartless. Dr. Lecher himself asked for ten minutes. The chair allowed him five. Before the time had run out, Dr. Lecher was on his feet again. Wolf burst out again with a motion to adjourn, refused by the chair. Wolf said the whole parliament wasn't worth a pinch of powder. The chair retorted that this was true in a case where a single member was able to make all parliamentary business impossible. Dr. Lecker continued his speech. The members of the majority went out by detachments from time to time and took naps upon sofas in the reception rooms and also refreshed themselves with food and drink in quantities nearly unbelievable. But the minority stayed loyally by their champion. Some distinguished deputies of the majority stayed with him, too, compelled thereto by admiration of his great performance. When a man has been speaking for eight hours, is it conceivable that he can still be interesting, still fascinating? When Dr. Lecker had been speaking eight hours, he was still compactly surrounded by friends who would not leave him, and by foes of all parties who could not and all hung enchanted and wondering upon his words, and all testified their admiration with constant and cordial outbursts of applause. Surely this was triumph without precedent in history. During the twelve-hour effort, friends brought to the orator three glasses of wine, four cups of coffee, one glass of beer, a most stingy reinforcement of his wasting tissues, but the hostile chair would permit no addition to it. But no matter, the chair could not beat that man. He was a garrison holding a fort, and was not to be starved out. When he had been speaking for eight hours, his pulse was seventy-two. When he had spoken for twelve, it was one hundred. He finished his long speech in these terms, as nearly as a permissibly free translation can convey them. I will now hasten to close my examination of the subject. I conceive that we of the left have made it clear to the honorable gentlemen of the other side of the house that we are stirred by no intemperate enthusiasm for this measure in its present shape. What we require and shall fight for with all lawful weapons is a formal, comprehensive, and definitive solution and settlement of these vexed matters. We desire restoration of the earlier condition of things the cancellation of all this incapable government's pernicious trades with Hungary, and release from the sorry burden of the Bedini ministry. I voice the hope. 
I know not if it will be fulfilled, I voice a deep and sincere and patriotic hope that the committee into whose hands this bill will eventually be committed will take its stand upon high ground and will return the Ausgleich Professorium to this house in a form which shall make it the protector and promoter alike of the great interests involved in the honor of our fatherland. After a pause, turning toward the government benches, but in any case, gentlemen of the majority, make sure of this. Henceforth, as before, you will find us at our post. The Germans of Austria will neither surrender nor die. Then burst a storm of applause which rose and fell, rose and fell, burst out again and again and again, explosion after explosion, hurricane after hurricane, with no apparent promise of ever coming to an end. And meantime, the whole left was surging and weltering about the champion, all bent upon wringing his hand and congratulating him and glorifying him. Finally, he got away and went home and ate five loaves and twelve baskets of fishes, read the morning papers, slept three hours, took a short drive, then returned to the house and set out the rest of the thirty-three hour session. To merely stand up in one spot twelve hours on a stretch is a feat which very few men could achieve. To add to the task the utterance of a hundred thousand words would be beyond the possibilities of the most of those few. To superimpose the requirement that the words should be put into the form of a compact, coherent, and symmetrical oration would possibly rule out the rest of the few, bar Dr. Lecker. End of Stirring Times in Austria by Mark Twain, Part 1 of 2During Times in Austria, an essay by Mark Twain. This article first appeared in Harper's New Monthly Magazine for March 1898, volume 96. This is part two of two. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section three, Curious Parliamentary Etiquette. In consequence of Dr. Lecker's twelve-hour speech and the other obstructions furnished by the minority, the famous thirty-three-hour sitting of the House accomplished nothing. The government side had made a supreme effort, assisting itself with all the helps at hand, both lawful and unlawful, yet had failed to get the Ausgleich into the hands of a committee. This was a severe defeat. The right was mortified, the left was jubilant. Parliament was adjourned for a week to let the members cool off, perhaps a sacrifice of precious time, for but two months remained in which to carry out the all-important Ausgleich to a consummation. If I have reported the behavior of the House intelligibly, the reader has been surprised at it, and has wondered whence these lawmakers come and what they are made of and he has probably supposed that the conduct exhibited in the long sitting was far out of the common, and due to the special excitement and irritation. As to the make-up of the house, it is this. The deputies come from all the walks of life and from all the grades of society. There are princes, counts, barons, priests, peasants, mechanics, laborers, lawyers, judges, physicians, professors, merchants, bakers, shopkeepers... They are all religious men. They are earnest, sincere, devoted, and they hate the Jews. The title of doctor is so common in the house that one may almost say that the deputy who does not bear it is by that reason conspicuous. I am assured that it is not a self-granted title, and not an honorary one, but an earned one, that in Austria it is very seldom conferred as a mere compliment that in Austria the degrees of doctor of music, doctor of philosophy, and so on, are not conferred by the seats of learning. And so, when an Austrian is called doctor, it means that he is either a lawyer or a physician, 
and that he is not a self-educated man but is college-bred and has been diplomaed for merit that answers the question of the constitution of the house now as to the house's curious manners the manners exhibited by this convention of doctors were not at that time being tried as a wholly new experiment i will go back to a previous sitting in order to show that the deputies had already had some practice there had been an incident the dignity of the house had been wounded by improprieties indulged in in its presence by a couple of the members the matter was placed in the hands of a committee to determine where the guilt lay and the degree of it and also to suggest the punishment the chairman of the committee brought in his report by this it appeared that in the course of his speech deputy shuramo said that religion had no proper place in public schools it was a private matter whereupon deputy grigory shouted how about free love to this deputy ero flung out this retort soda water at the vimberger this appeared to deeply offend deputy grigory who shouted back to at ero you cowardly blitherskite say that again the committee had set for three hours grigory had apologized ero had explained ero explained that he didn't say anything about soda water at the vimberger he explained in writing and was very explicit i declare upon my word of honor that i did not say the words attributed to me unhappily for his word of honor it was proved by the official stenographers and by the testimony of several deputies that he did say them the committee did not officially know why the apparently inconsequential reference to soda water at the vimberger should move deputy grigory to call the utter of it a cowardly blitherskite still after proper deliberation it was the opinion that the house ought to formally censure the whole business this verdict seems to have been regarded as sharply severe i think so because deputy dr luger burgermeister of vienna felt it a duty to soften the blow to his friend grigory by showing that the soda water remark was not so innocuous as it might look that indeed grigory's tough retort was justifiable and he proceeded to explain why he read a number of scandalous postcards which he intimated had proceeded from ero as indicated by the handwriting though they were anonymous some of them were posted to grigory at his place of business and could have been read by all his subordinates the others were posted to grigory's wife luger did not say but every one knew that the cards referred to a matter of town gossip which made mr grigory a chief actor in a tavern scene where siphon squirting played a prominent and humorous part and wherein women had a share there were several of the cards more than several in fact no fewer than five were sent in one day dr luger read some of them and described others some of them had pictures on them one a picture of a hog with a monstrous snout and beside it a squirting soda siphon below it some sort of sarcastic doggerel grigory deals in shirts cravats etc one of the cards bore these remarks much respected deputy and collar sore or stealer another hurrah for the christian social work among the women assemblages hurrah for the soda squirter a comment by dr luger i cannot venture to read the rest of that one nor the signature either another would you mind telling me if comment by dr luger the rest of it is not properly readable to deputy grigory's wife much respected madame grigory the undersigned desires an invitation to the next soda squirt comment by dr luger neither the rest of the card nor the signature can i venture to read to the house so vulgar they are the purpose of this card to expose grigory to his family was repeated in all of these other anonymous missives the house by vote censured the two improper deputies this may have had a modifying effect upon the phraseology of the membership for a while and upon its general exuberance also but it was not for long 
as had been seen it had become lively once more on the night of the long sitting at the next sitting after the long one there was certainly no lack of liveliness the president was persistently ignoring the rules of the house in the interests of the government side and the minority were in an unappeasable fury about it the ceaseless din and uproar the shouting and stamping and dust banging were deafening but through it all burst voices now and then that made themselves heard some of the remarks were of a very candid sort and i believe that if they had been uttered in our house of representatives they would have attracted attention i will insert some samples here not in their order but selected on their merits dr may Rader to the president you have lied you conceded the floor to me make it good or you have lied mr glichner to the president leave get out wolf indicating the president there sits a man to whom a certain title belongs unto wolf who is continuously reading in a powerful voice from a newspaper arrive these personal remarks from the majority oh shut your mouth put him out out with him wolf stops reading a moment to shut at dr Lieger, who has the floor but cannot get a hearing please betrayer of the people begin dr Lieger, meine herren oh ho and groans come out wolf that's the holy light of the christian socialist mr klotzenbauer the christian socialist damnation are you ever going to quiet down wolf discharges a galling remark at mr Voldmeyer. Voldmeyer responding you jew you there is a momentous lull and dr Lieger begins his speech graceful handsome man with winning manners and attractive bearing a bright and easy speaker and is said to know how to trim his political sails to catch any favoring wind that blows he manages to say a few words then the tempest overwhelms him again wolf stops reading his paper a moment to say a drastic thing about luger and his christian social pieties which sets the christian socialists in a sort of frenzy mr Filolavich, you leave the christian socialists alone you word of honor breaker obstruct all you want to but you leave them alone you've no business in this house you belong in a gin mill mr prochaska in a lunatic asylum you mean Filolavich, it's a pity that such a man should be a leader of the germans he disgraces the german name dr schneider it's a shame that the like of him should insult us Sroba to wolf contemptible cub we will bounce thee out of this it is inferable that the thee is not intended to indicate affection this time but to reinforce and emphasize mr strobach's scorn dr scheicher his insults are of no consequence he wants his ears boxed dr Lieger to wolf you'd better worry a trifle over your iro's word of honor you are behaving like a street arab dr scheicher it's infamous dr Lieger, and these shameless creatures are the leaders of the german people's party meantime wolf goes whooping along with his newspaper readings in great contentment dr Petai, shut up shut up shut up you haven't the floor strobach the miserable cub dr Lieger, to wolf raising his voice strenuously above the storm you are a wholly honorless street brat a voice fire the rapscallion out but wolf so goes marching noisily along just the same schoenerer vast and muscular and endowed with the most powerful voice in the reichsrath comes ploughing down through the standing crowds red and choking with anger halts before deputy Volmeyer, grabs a rule and smashes it with a blow upon the desk threatens Volmeyer's face with his fist and bells out some personalities and a promise only you wait we'll teach you a whirlwind of offensive retorts assails him from the band of the meek and humble christian socialists 
compacted around the leader, that distinguished religious expert, Dr. Luger, Burgermeister of Vienna. Our breath comes in excited gasps now, and we are full of hope. We imagine that we are back 50 years ago in the Arkansas legislature, and we think we know what is going to happen, and we are glad we came, and glad we are up in the gallery out of the way where we can see the whole thing and yet not have to supply any of the material for the inquest. However, as it turns out, our confidence is abused. Our hopes are misplaced. Dr. Petai, wildly excited, you quiet down or we shall turn ourselves loose. There will be a cuffing of ears. Prochaska in a fury. No, not ear-boxing, but genuine blows. Filolavik, I would rather take my head off to a Jew than to Wolf. Srobak to Wolf. Jew flunky, here we have been fighting the Jews for ten years, and now you are helping them to power again. How much do you get for it? Polanski, what he wants is a straitjacket. Wolf continues his readings. It is a market report now. Remark flung across the house to Schoenair. Die Grußmutter auf den Misthaufen erzeugt worden. It will be judicious not to translate that. Its flavor is pretty high, in any case, but it becomes particularly gamey when you remember that the first gallery was well stocked with ladies. Apparently it was a great hit. It fetched thunders of joyous enthusiasm out of the Christian socialists, and in their rapture they flung biting epithets with wasteful liberality at special detested members of the opposition. Among others, this one had schoener air, Bordel in der Krugerstrasse. Then they added these words, which they whooped, howled, and even sang in deep voice chorus. Schmul lieb kun, schmul lieb kun, schmul lieb kun and made it splendidly audible above the banging of desk boards and the rest of the roaring cyclone of Fendish noises. A gallery witticism comes flitting by from mouth to mouth around the great curve. The swan song of Austrian representative government. You can note its progress by the applause of smiles and nods as it skims along. Kletzenbauer. Holofern is where is Judith? There's a storm of laughter. Rigorig, the shirt merchant. This wolf theater is costing six thousand florins. Wolf, with sweetness. Notice him, gentlemen. It is Mr. Grigorig. There's laughter. Philolavik to Wolf. You, Judas. Schneider. Rather knight. Chorus of voices. East German, awful tub. And so the war of epithets crashes along with never diminishing energy for a couple of hours. The ladies in the gallery were learning. That was well, for by and by, ladies will form a part of the membership of all the legislatures in the world. As soon as they can prove competency, they will be admitted. At present, men only are competent to legislate. Therefore, they look down upon women and would feel degraded if they had to have them for colleagues in their high calling. Wolf is yelling another market report now. Guessman, shut up, you infamous louse brat. During a momentary lull, Dr. Luger gets a hearing for three sentences of his speech. They demand and require that the president shall suppress the four noisiest members of the opposition. Wolf, with a that settles it toss of the head, the shifty trickster of Vienna has spoken. Ero belonged to Schoener's party. The word of honor incident has given it a new name. Grigori is a Christian socialist and hero of the postcards and the Wimberger soda squirting incident. He stands vast and conspicuous and conceited and self-satisfied and roosterish and inconsequential at Luger's elbow and is proud and cocky to be in such great company. He looks very well indeed, really majestic and aware of it. He crows out his little empty remark now and then, and looks as pleased as if he had been delivered of the Ausgleich. Indeed, he does look notably fine. He wears almost the only dress vest on the floor. It exposes a continental spread of white shirt front. His hands are posed at ease in the lips of his trouser pockets. 
his head is tilted back complacently he is attitudinizing he is playing to the gallery however they are all doing that it is curious to see men who only vote and can't make speeches and don't know how to invent witty ejaculations wander about the vacant parts of the floor and stop in a good place and strike attitudes attitudes suggestive of weighty thought mostly and glance furtively up in the galleries to see how it works or a couple will come together and shake hands in an artificial way and laugh a gay manufactured laugh and do some constrained and self-conscious attitudinizing and they steal glances at the galleries to see if they are getting notice it is like a scene on the stage by play by minor actors at the back while the stars do the great work in the front even count badini attitudinizes for a moment and strikes a reflective napoleonic attitude of fine picturesqueness but soon thinks better of it and desists there are two who do not attitudinize poor harried and insulted president abramovitz who seems to be totally miserable and can find no way to put the dreary time but by swinging his bell and by discharging occasional remarks which nobody can hear and a resigned and patient priest who sits lonely in a great vacancy on majority territory and munches an apple Scherner lifts his foghorn of a voice and shakes the roof with an insult discharged at the majority dr lure the honorless party would better keep still here grigory the echo welling out of his shirt front yes keep quiet pimp Scherner to Liger, political mountebank, Puchaska to Scherner, drunken clown. During the final hour of the sitting, many happy phrases were distributed through the proceedings. Among them were these, and they are strikingly good ones. Blatherskite, blackguard, scoundrel, brothel daddy. This last was a contribution of Dr. Gessman and gave great satisfaction and deservedly it seems to me that it was one of the most sparkling things that was said during the whole evening at half past two in the morning the house adjourned the victory was with the opposition no not quite that the effective part of it was snatched away from them by an unlawful exercise of presidential force another contribution toward driving the mistreated minority out of their minds at other sittings of the parliament gentlemen of the opposition shaking their fists for the president addressed him as polish dog at one sitting the angry deputy turned upon a colleague and shouted blank you must try to imagine what it was if i should offer it even the original word would probably not get by the magazine editor's blue pencil to offer a translation would be to waste my ink of course this remark was frankly printed in its entirety by one of the Vienna dailies, but the others disguised the toughest half of it with stars. If the reader will go back over this chapter and gather its array of extraordinary epithets into a bunch and examine them, he will marvel at two things. How this convention of gentlemen should consent to use such gross terms, and why the users were allowed to get out of the place alive there is no way to understand this strange situation if every man in the house were a professional blackguard and had his home in a sailor boarding house one could still not understand it for although that sort do use such terms they never take them these men are not professional blackguards they are mainly gentlemen and educated yet they use these terms and take them too they really seem to attach no consequence to them. One cannot say that they act like schoolboys, for that is only almost true. Not entirely. Schoolboys blackguarded each other fiercely and by the hour, and one would think that nothing would ever come of it but noise, but that would be a mistake. Up to a certain limit the result would be noise only, but that limit overstepped, trouble would follow right away. There are certain phrases phrases of a peculiar character, phrases of the nature of that reference to Schoenherr's grandmother, for instance, which not even the most spiritless schoolboy in the English-speaking world would allow to pass unavenged. 
One difference between schoolboys and the lawmakers of the Reichsrath seems to be that the lawmakers have no limit, no danger line. Apparently they may call each other whatever they please and go home unmutilated. Now, in fact, they did have a scuffle on two occasions, but it was not on account of names called. There has been no scuffle where that was the cause. It is not to be inferred that the house lacks a sense of honor because it lacks delicacy. That would be an error. Ero was caught in a lie, and it profoundly disgraced him. The house cut him, turned its back upon him. He resigned his seat, otherwise he would have been expelled. But it was lenient with Grigorig, who had called Ero a cowardly blatherskite in a debate. It merely went through the form of mildly censuring. That did not trouble Grigori. The Viennese say of themselves that they are an easy-going, pleasure-loving community, making the best of life, and not taking it very seriously. Nevertheless, they are grieved about the ways of their parliament, and say, quite frankly, that they are ashamed. They claim that the low condition of parliament's manners is new, not old. A gentleman who was at the head of the government twenty years ago confirms this, and says that in his time the parliament was orderly and well behaved. An English gentleman of long residence here endorses this, and says that, that a low order of politicians originated in the present forms of questionable speech on the stump some years ago, and imported them into the parliament. However, some day there will be a minister of etiquette and sergeant-at-arms, and then things will go better. I mean, if Parliament and the Constitution survive the present storm. Section 4. The Historic Climax During the whole of November, things went from bad to worse. The all-important Ausgleich remained hard aground and could not be sparred off. Badini's government could not withdraw the language ordinance and keep its majority, and the opposition would, could not be placated on easier terms. One night, while the customary pandemonium was crashing and thundering along at its best, a fight broke out. It was a surging, struggling, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder scramble. A great many blows were struck. Twice Schoenerer lifted one of the heavy ministerial futules, some say with one hand, and threatened members of the majority with it, but it was wrenched away from him. A member hammered Wolf over the head with the president's bell, and another member choked him. A professor was flung down and belabored with fists and choked. He held up an open penknife as a defense against the blows. It was snatched from him and flung to a distance. It hit a peaceful Christian socialist who wasn't doing anything and brought blood from his hand. This was the only blood drawn. The men who got hammered and choked looked sound and well the next day. The fists and the bell were not properly handled, or better results would have been apparent. I am quite sure that the fighters were not in earnest. On Thanksgiving Day, the sitting was a history-making one. On that day, the harried, bedeviled, and despairing government went insane. In order to free itself from the thraldom of the opposition, it committed this curiously juvenile crime. It moved an important change of the rules of the House, forbade debate upon the motion, put it to a stand-up vote instead of A's and no's, and then gravely claimed that it had been adopted whereas to even the dullest witness, if I without modesty may pretend to that place, it was plain that nothing legitimately to be called a vote had been taken at all. I think that Saltpeter never uttered a truer thing than when he said, Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Evidently the government's mind was tottering when this bald insult to the house was the best way it could contrive for getting out of the frying pan. The episode would have been funny if the matter at stake had been a trifle, but in the circumstances it was pathetic. The usual storm was raging in the house. As usual, many of the majority and most of the minority were standing up to have a better chance to exchange epithets and make other noises. Into this storm Count Falkenhayn 
entered with his paper in his hand, and at once there was a rush to get near him and hear him read his motion. In a moment he was walled in by listeners. The several clauses of his motion were loudly applauded by these allies, and as loudly disapplauded, if I may invent a word, by such of the opposition as could hear his voice. When he took his seat, the president promptly put the motion, persons desiring to vote in the affirmative stand up, the house was already standing up, had been standing for an hour, and before a third of it had found out what the president had been saying, he had proclaimed the adoption of the motion, and only a few heard that. In fact, when the house is legislating, you can't tell it from artillery practice. You will realize what a happy idea it was to sidetrack the lawful A's and no's and substitute a stand-up vote by this fact that a little later, when a deputation of deputies waited upon the president and asked him if he was actually willing to proclaim that the measure had been passed, he answered, yes, and unanimously. It shows that, in effect, the whole house was on its feet when that trick was sprung. Footnote. In that gracious bygone time, when a mild and good-tempered spirit was the atmosphere of our house, when the manner of our speakers was studiously formal and academic, and the storms and explosions of today were wholly unknown, etc. This was the translation of an opening remark of an editorial in this morning's Neue Freie Presse, December 1st, 1897. Mark Twain, end of footnote. The Lex Falkenhayn, thus strangely born, gave the president power to suspend for three days any deputy who should continue to be disorderly after being called to order twice, and it also placed at his disposal such force as might be necessary to make the suspension effective. So the House had a sergeant-at-arms at last, and a more formal one as to power than any other legislature in Christendom had ever possessed. The Lex Falkenhayn also gave the House itself authority to suspend members for thirty days. On these terms, the Ausgleich would be put through in an hour, apparently. The opposition would have to sit meek and quiet and stop obstructing or be turned into the street, deputy after deputy, leaving the majority an unvexed field for its work. Certainly the thing looked well. The government was out of the frying pan at last. It congratulated itself, and was almost girlishly happy. Its stock rose suddenly from less than nothing to a premium. It confessed to itself, with pride, that its Lex Falkenhayn was a masterstroke, a work of genius. However, there were doubters, men who were troubled, and believed that a grave mistake had been made, that it might be that the opposition was crushed, and profitably for the country too. But the manner of it, the manner of it, that was the serious part. It could have far-reaching results, results whose gravity might transcend all guessing. It might be the initial step toward a return to government by force, a restoration of the irresponsible methods of obsolete times. There were no vacant seats in the galleries the next day. In fact, standing room outside the building was at a premium. There were crowds there, and a glittering array of helmeted and brass-buttoned police, on foot and on horseback, to keep them from getting too much excited. No one could guess what was going to happen, but everyone felt that something was going to happen, and hoped that he might have a chance to see it, or at least get the news of it while it was fresh. At noon the house was empty for I do not count myself. Half an hour later, the two galleries were solidly packed. The floor was still empty. Another half hour later, Wolf entered and passed to his place, and then other deputies began to stream in, among them many forms and faces familiar of late. By one o'clock, the membership was present in full force. A band of socialists stood grouped inside the ministerial desks in the shadow of the presidential tribune. It was observable that these official strongholds were now protected against rushes by bolted gates, and that these were in ward of servants wearing the house's livery. Also, the removable 
desk boards had been taken away and nothing left for disorderly members to slap with there was a pervading anxious hush at least what stood very well for a hush in that house it was believed by many that the opposition was cowed and that there would be no more obstruction no more noise that was an error presently the president entered by the distant door to the right followed by vice president fuchs and the two took their way down past the polish benches toward the tribune instantly the customary storm of noises burst out and was higher and higher and wilder and wilder and really seemed to surpass anything that had gone before it in that place the president took his seat and begged for order but no one could hear him his lips moved one could see that he bowed his body forward appealingly and spread his great hand eloquently over his breast one could see that but as concerned his uttered words he was probably could not hear them himself below him was the crowd of two dozen socialists glaring up at him shaking their fists at him roaring imprecations and insulting epithets at him this went on for some time suddenly the socialists burst through the gates and stormed up through the ministerial benches and a man in a red cravat reached up and snatched the documents that lay on the president's desk and flung them abroad the next moment he and his allies were struggling and fighting with a half dozen uniformed servants who were there to protect the new gates meantime a detail of socialists had swarmed up the side steps and overflowed the president and the vice and were crowding and shouldering and shoving them out of the place they crowded them out and down the steps and across the house past the police benches and all about them swarmed the hostile poles and checks who resisted them one could see fists go up and come down with other signs and shows of a heady fight then the president and the vice disappeared through the door of the entrance and the victorious socialists turned and marched back mounted the tribune flung the president's bell and his remaining papers abroad and then stood there in a compact little crowd eleven strong and held the place as if it were a fortress their friends on the floor were in a frenzy of triumph and manifested it in their deafening way the whole house was on its feet amazed and wondering it was an astonishing situation and imposingly dramatic no one had looked for this the unexpected had happened what next but there can be no next the play is over the grand climax is reached the possibilities are exhausted ring down the curtain not yet that distant door opens again and now we see what history will be talking of five centuries hence a uniformed and helmeted battalion of bronzed and stalwart men marching in double file down the floor of the house a free parliament profaned by an invasion of brute force it was an odious spectacle odious and awful for one moment it was an unbelievable thing a thing beyond all credibility it must be a delusion a dream a nightmare but no it was real pitifully real shamefully real hideously real these sixty policemen had been soldiers and they went at their work with the cold unsentimentality of their trade they ascended the steps of the tribune laid their hands upon the inviolable persons of the representatives of a nation and dragged and tugged and hauled them down the steps and out the door then ranged themselves in a stately military array in front of the ministerial estrade and so stood it was a tremendous episode the memory of it will outlast all the thrones that exist today in the whole history of free parliaments the like of it had been seen but three times before it takes its imposing place among the world's unforgettable things i think that in my lifetime i have not twice seen abiding history made before my eyes but i know that i have seen it once some of the results of this wild freak followed instantly the badini government came down with a crash there was a popular outbreak or two in vienna and there were three or four days of furious writing in prague followed by the establishing there of martial law the jews and germans were harried and plundered and their houses destroyed in other bohemian towns there was rioting in some cases the germans being the rioters in others the czechs 
and in all cases the Jew had to roast no matter which side he was on. We are well along in December now. The new minister-president has not been able to patch up a peace amongst the warring factions of Parliament. Therefore there is no use in calling it together again for the present. Public opinion believes that parliamentary government and the Constitution are actually threatened with extinction, and the permanency of the monarchy itself is a not absolutely certain thing. Yes, the Lex Falkenhayn was a great invention, and it did what was claimed for it. It got the government out of the frying pan. End of Stirring Times in Austria by Mark Twain